Good morning, welcome to the solution video to problem C of the 2021 Facebook Hacker Cup round one. In this problem, we're given a tree, and this is a weighted tree, where every edge has a weight between one and 20, so it's a very important, very strict requirement on these weights. And we wanna ship some sort of materials between every pair of nodes in this tree. The amount of material we can ship between some pair is equal to the minimum along that path. So if we look at these two nodes here, the minimum along this path is equal to two. So we can ship two units of material from the top node to the bottom node there. And the minimum along this path here is equal to one. Now, in order to do harm to some of our, some of our opponents, uh, some of our, our competitors here, we're going to disrupt some edge on this tree. We wanna know what's the answer for every edge of the tree. And the question that we're asking that we want the answer to is if we disrupt this edge, so say we disrupt this edge here, um, that's the same as like setting its capacity equal to zero. Then after disrupting that edge, what is the total amount of shipment that can occur between all pairs of nodes after disrupting the edge? In this case, the total amount of shipment would be five for this pair, one for this pair, one for this pair, and three for this pair. So the answer for this particular edge, if we disrupt this edge, would be 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 3, which is equal to 6 plus 4, or 10. So in this case, um, this is equal to 10, which means after disrupting this edge, we can still ship 10 units of material between, between every pair in total. So this 10 would be the answer for this edge, but we want the edge for all possible um, nodes in this tree. Uh, and then we want the product of all of those in order to decrease the size of the input, but really we should just worry about, let's solve this for every edge in the tree. So for each edge, we wanna solve it relatively quickly, right? We, we can't even look at all of the nodes for a single edge. We have to be, we have to be faster about it. Um, okay, so this is what the problem asks. One minor simplification that I think is helpful in like understanding the solution to the problem is let's first consider what is the total amount that can be shipped between all nodes in this tree originally? And then let's consider for each possible edge, if we were to remove this edge, how much would that number decrease by? So the amount that something decreases by, uh, let's look at this, this edge here that we were talking about earlier. It's probably the most interesting one in this example. We have two rough subtrees, and we can say, we can assign each node a value, which is equal to the minimum if you look at the closest node to this edge, if you look at the path from the closest node to this edge to it. So this node has a value of basically 20. Uh, this node has a value of one. And this node has a value of five. Really this is like, the, this node is basically, it has a value of infinity, but since the biggest edge is possible or 20, we'll just consider it as 20 instead. And then for this bottom subtree, this has a value of 20, and this has a value of three. So let's look at what these two sets look like and then how they interact. Um, so on the top, we have 20, 5, and 1. And then on the bottom, we have a 20 and a 3. Now, if we were actually solving it for this edge, these two sets would both have up to maybe half a million elements. So we wouldn't be able to even iterate through even one of these sets very quickly. But the important constraint, which I mentioned earlier, is that every edge has a weight of at most 20 which really cuts down on the number of unique pairs here. In fact, we have at most 400 unique pairs. We have at most 20 things on the top set and 20 things in the bottom set. And we can afford to iterate through each of those separately. Um, in fact, if we want to, we can actually speed up the solution to not require iterating through 400 things for every edge. We can iterate through only 20 uh, by doing some two-pointer sweep shenanigans, but we won't worry about that in this video. Um, you can do some two-pointer stuff if you want to speed up your solution, but it, it probably isn't necessary to get this problem correct. Um, so yeah, what is the general idea for solving this without that? So let's look at these two 20s. What these correspond to are these two nodes. And for these two nodes, we have basically no restriction on, on this node here. Also basically no restriction on this node here, but there's a restriction between them of crossing this edge of two. So for these two, uh, we would have uh, a like, value of two. Um, for a bunch of other ones, there'd be a value of two. Let's look at this pair as well. So in this pair, we're going from this node on the bottom to this one right here on the top. And that looks like this path here. And the minimum along this path is the minimum of 20, one, and this two. 
So this path has a minimum of just one. So if we look at all pairs from the top to the bottom here, uh, these two have a distance of two, two, and one, and then two, two, and one. So in this case, the total amount of disrupted shipment is, well, I guess it's also 10. But it turns out these are just a coincidence that these two are the same. Uh, because the total amount shipped in this graph, assuming all my math is correct, is 20. Um, so if we if we knew that the total amount shipped was 10, then or was 20, then 20 minus 10 should give us this 10 here. Um, okay, so there are a couple parts that I have skipped over in the solution here. Uh, one of them is how do we calculate the initial total value, and the other is how do we get these two sets. So uh, yeah, really we don't want these as like a set of numbers as like a big array because it would be too big. Instead, we'll just take, if we had this set, we want to know what's the frequency of every number from 1 to 20 in it. So instead of having some big, um, some big vector, some big array list, we'll just have a frequency count that's an array of size 20. And we'll have that for both of these. So now what we need is, well, for every edge, we need, if you split this edge in half, what is the frequency count of all of the nodes on the top's value and then all of the nodes on the bottom's value? Okay, let's clean up this picture a little bit here. I guess we'll just remove that. That should be good enough. And then uh, let's talk about how we can do that. So if we root the tree arbitrarily, let's say we root it at this node here, we can get a tree that looks like this. And what we can notice about this is that every node defines some subtree. So let's look at this node here. This defines some subtree here. And what we want is for this node, we want the value of everything in its subtree. And then we also want the value of everything not in this subtree. So to get the value of everything in the subtree, we can do this with just a DFS. And the runtime will be the number of nodes times 20. Um, so here's how we do that. We first DFS on all the kids, and for each kid, we say, okay, what's the value in that kid's subtree? So what's the value in here? And we want to know what's the frequency count of the blue number next to every node if we're considering this as like the root edge. So then to look at how the answer changes if we were to include this node as well, we know, let's say this, this has a value of three, which is in fact the case. The set of answers for this node will just be 20, uh, because it's just this node by itself. So when we include this 3 and also this node, we're going to add a 20, because this node is currently unbounded. And then everything in this set, which is bigger than 3, will get floored down to 3, or I guess ceilinged down to 3. It'll get pushed down uh, to be 3. So here there's a 20 here. This 20 gets set to be a 3. And then this 23 is the same set that we have here. So that's a rough example of how we do this recursively. So that'll give us the answer for all of these, these downward facing sets. We still need the answer for everything that's upward facing. And we can do it in a very similar way, just with a second DFS. So first we'll do a DFS to look at, we'll get the answer for everything in our subtree. After that, we can do a second DFS. And the reason that's helpful is because the second DFS can be pretty easily calculated from the result of the first DFS. So if we have some node here, and we have some imaginary answer for everything that is uh, not in this, this subtree here, we have our edge here, and then we have some children here. I'll, I'll just draw two children for simplicity. And then each of these have their own subtrees. So if we want to say, OK, we want to pass this answer recursively to one of our kids. Let's say we want to pass it to this, this right kid right here. Um, we need to include all of these nodes. We need to bound each of those nodes by this edge. We also need to include this subtree here. And then we need to bound this subtree by this edge here. Uh, so we can, we can do all of that. The problem with that, like that, that's all pretty easy to do, right? We know how to bound something by an edge. We just set anything that's bigger than 20, or bigger than, I guess, if this edge is 3, anything that's bigger than 3 down to 3, and everything that's 3 and smaller stays the same. So all the frequencies there stay the same. 
Um, so we know how to do this. The problem is this works great if we only have two kids, but if we have a large number of kids, right? let's say we have order n kids, then the runtime of this will be n squared, because for each kid, we have to iterate through all the other kids. So that's not acceptable. Instead, we can speed up the solution by calculating uh, for every kid what is like the sum of values for all the kids. Right? So we're going to take all of these things, combine them together, and bound each by its corresponding edge to the parent. And then when we want to travel down, so when we want to travel down into this subtree here, we'll remove the contribution of this. Because we've, we've just added in this node here, we'll remove this contribution. And then if we, if we have like everything minus this, that'll give us exactly the set we're looking for, which, sorry to draw a lot of circles here, but it looks like that. Um, so yeah, that's the general idea. OK, hopefully that made sense. The, the top level summary here is First, we're going to calculate, well, OK, actually, there's, there's one more part that I do want to discuss. And that is now we have the distance from every node to every other node in the tree. So we have the distance from this node to everything in your subtree. Um, yeah, we have the distance from this node to everything in the subtree, and then also to everything not in the subtree. And that will let us calculate the initial answer if we destroy no edges. So that's the solution we're looking for there. So we have the initial answer from these two arrays that we've calculated if we destroy no edges. And then for each edge, we can build that like I described earlier in the beginning of this video. OK, so TLDR, top level solution idea. We're going to do a DFS. Uh, we do the first DFS to calculate for each subtree. What is the frequency of nodes with every possible blue number here? So what is the frequency of nodes with value 3, with value 5, with value 20? Once we do that, we're going to do a second DFS, and this will calculate for things not in this subtree. What is the possible answer? Or what is the frequency of nodes with every possible value uh, from 1 to 20? And then finally, for each edge, we can say, let's do uh, a 20 squared loop and consider for every possible value of things in the top and every possible value of things in the bottom. Um, let's calculate what their value is and then how many times this pair occurs. So maybe you have a value of 3 on the top, of 7 on the bottom, and an edge of 2. Uh, the value here is going to be 2, because the min of 3, 7, and uh, 2 is, is 2. And then if we know the frequencies of things here and here, the total number of pairs that will look just like this is equal to just their product. Uh, so yeah, that, that solves that there. OK, hopefully that solution made sense. Um, if you'd like something a bit more formal and mathematical, you can check out the written analysis, uh, the written editorial. I'll link to that in the description. And then we also have um, model solutions, which you can take a look at if you want to see some code. Thank you for watching. Hopefully that was mildly helpful, and hopefully you enjoyed the contest. Have a good day. Goodbye.